This amazing chart is known as the periodic table, invented by a man named Dmitry Mendeleev, and countless others who also contributed towards the basic organization of elements into a chart that would make sense. Back in the old days, the elements were ordered in order of increasing atomic mass. However, that doesn't always work. For example, down here, tellurium actually weighs more than iodine, but Mendeleev decided to place iodine here below bromine, chlorine, and fluorine because iodine has very similar chemical properties to these elements. As it turned out later on down the road, when you put them in order of increasing atomic number, which is something they didn't know about in Mendeleev's time, then everything works out fine. 52 protons, 53 protons. So the modern periodic table has elements in increasing atomic number. When you place elements in order of increasing atomic number, periodically their properties are going to repeat. This is why it's called the periodic table, because the properties repeat periodically. For example, elements 1, 3, 11, 19, 37, 55, and 87 all share very similar chemical properties. These are called alkali metals. Alkali metals have the property of being extremely reactive metals. They're never found in their pure state because the second you find them in their pure state, well, they're going to immediately react with whatever happens to be around them. They react violently with water to produce hydrogen gas and a base. Bases are called alkalis, which is why these are called alkali metals. When you, when you put these in water, you form lithium hydroxide and hydrogen, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen, potassium hydroxide and hydrogen, and so on. Here we have some sodium. Sodium is an element representative of an alkali metal, a very, very reactive element. You might notice that this metal is submerged in oil. If it's exposed to the air, it's going to immediately oxidize. We'll take a piece of it out. Now, notice how nice and shiny that metal is. It won't stay that way for long, though, if I leave it out in the open air. Distilled water. Phenol failing will test for the presence of a base. If this is truly an alkali metal, then the solution will turn pink as the sodium reacts. Now, let's put the sodium in and see what happens. Notice how the sodium melts as it hits the water. The heat of reaction is so high that the sodium actually turns into a liquid. And because it's less dense than air, it floats. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing. That's just the hydrogen gas that this is giving off as it goes. Notice the pink color? That proves that sodium is an alkali metal because the pink color represents the fact that there's a base, sodium hydroxide, in this beaker. All the elements in group two are known as the alkaline earth metals. These are less reactive than the alkali metals, and yet they're still very reactive with water. They're not as violently reactive, but they'll react just the same. So you have to keep them in a nice, tightly sealed container, otherwise they oxidize very quickly. Once again, these elements are never found in their pure state in nature. Here I have a piece of calcium metal. Calcium is an alkaline earth metal. This element is also reactive with water, as you'll notice when I react it with this water, which has also had phenolphthalein added to it to detect for the presence of a base. First thing you'll notice is that there is, in fact, a pink color developing, although a lot slower than with the sodium. In addition, the calcium is not floating on the surface. It's more dense than the water, so it sinks to the bottom. In addition, the heat is not enough to melt the calcium, so the calcium remains a solid even as it's oxidized by the water. You'll also notice the vast amount of bubbles being produced. Those bubbles are bubbles of hydrogen gas. Calcium hydroxide is the solution that's filling the beaker, and hydrogen gas is the gas in those bubbles. Because of this, calcium, like all group 2 metals, 
are never found in their pure state in nature. They're always combined with other elements. Very vigorous reaction. The calcium hydroxide that's produced is only slightly soluble in water, which is why we're getting a precipitate or cloudiness in our solution. Elements in groups 3 through 12 are called the transition metals. Now, you might remember when we did the valence electrons, we said valence electrons come from the S sublevel or the P sublevel, which is why they add up to 8. But elements that are in groups 3 through 12 can also lose electrons from their next lowest D sublevel. They don't play by the rules. These elements have some very interesting properties. Notably, they can form more than one possible positive ion charge. All the elements in group 1 form plus 1 charges when they lose their one and only valence electron. All the elements in group 2, when they lose their two valence electrons, form plus 2 ions. But these elements here, chromium, can form several charges, plus 2, plus 3, or plus 6. Iron can be plus 2 or plus 3. Copper can be plus 1 or plus 2. Some of them are only one charge, like silver can only be plus 1, but gold can be plus 1 or plus 3. So transition metals can have more than one charge because they lose D electrons as well as S and P electrons. Not only that, but compounds that form more than one charge, their compounds tend to be colored. For example, copper compounds tend to be blue, and iron compounds tend to be orange or red, where chromium compounds tend to be yellow or orange, and manganese compounds are a lovely shade of purple. Transition metal compounds are colored. The pink color comes from the transition metal cobalt. The yellow color comes from the transition metal chromium. The orange color comes from the transition metal chromium. The blue color comes from the transition metal copper. The yellow color comes from the transition metal iron. Transition metal compounds tend to be colored. Elements in group 17, these nonmetals right here, they have seven valence electrons, and they desperately want one more to make a stable octet. These, these elements right here have extremely high electronegativity, and will therefore remove electrons from pretty much any other element on the periodic table. They're highly corrosive. These elements are known as the halogens. They are nasty, vicious, and vile, and they're used as antibacterials. You can, fluor you can put fluoride in water to kill bacteria at water sewage treatment plants. You can put chlorine in water to kill bacteria in swimming pools. You can put bromine in water to kill bacteria in swimming pools that are indoors. You can use iodine to kill bacteria in cuts. Ever get that orange stuff put on your cuts? That's a tincture of iodine. Iodine dissolved in alcohol. Iodine also has the property of being very poisonous to bacteria. Generally, as you go from top to bottom, the elements become less reactive. If you try to put fluorine on your cut, it would basically dissolve your skin. Elements in group 18 have a stable octet as their valence energy level. Basically, they don't have any unpaired electrons. They've got eight valence electrons. They don't need any more. They don't need to gain any. They don't need to lose any. Elements in group 18 will not form compounds with other elements. Not in nature. Now, there are a couple of exceptions here. Krypton and xenon have charges written for them, all right? And that may sound unusual. I mean, they're supposed to be noble gases. In the laboratory, you can force fluorine to bond with these two noble gases to form extremely unstable compounds. Fluorine is the only element that's got the chutzpah enough to try to take on a noble gas, but only in the laboratory. In nature, you'll never see these things bonded to anything else.